Kelly Crew here back with your SNOMED CT Expo Day 2 Spotlight. Welcome back. I hope that I find you well rested and ready to finish up Day 2 of the Expo program. Were you up early today? <laughs> if so, you may have had the chance to start the day off with David Hansen's discussion about artificial intelligence technology and how it enables the future of healthcare. If not, please take the time to watch it on demand. Day 2 features 17 concurrent sessions focusing on clinical content enhancements, implementation wins, targeted conversations regarding the International Patient Summary and COVID-19, including SNOMED CT enabled vaccine certificates. Some thought provoking sessions that you won't wanna miss out on. Our last keynote of this year's expo is sponsored by longstanding SNOMED CT supporter, Goldblatt Systems, presenting our 2021 James Reed Memorial Lecture, Professor Danny Prieto Alhambra. Danny brings his insights into how to use distributed network analyses to generate reliable, real-world evidence in the midst of a pandemic. Rounding out the program, day two tutorials welcome the education team back to the stage to present an introduction to post coordination and SNOMED CT and analytics. Today, please continue to connect with fellow attendees via the meeting hub and check in on this year's collection of vibrant sponsors and exhibitors committed to the use and the evolution of SNOMED CT. As an organization, SNOMED International thanks you again for attending the expo. Please don't forget to share your feedback on the event by completing the survey that we'll make available for you to complete. I now would like to welcome Ivan Boyd to the stage representing Goldblatt Systems to kick off our James Reed lecture. Ivan, over to you. Welcome. What an honor and a pleasure it is to again introduce the James Reed Memorial Lecture Speaker. We at Goldblatt Systems have long worked with SNOMED CT in furthering its vision of a more effective data-driven healthcare, as well as through our own technology and laboratory ventures. Our speaker this morning, Dr. Danny Prieto Alhambra, shares this vision. It sounds so simple to in Danny's own statements to collect the health data to generate reliable evidence for improved patient care. But it surely is not that simple. If COVID has taught us anything about data, it is that it remains scattered, siloed, and often supports the interventional needs at a particular point in time for that particular issue being confronted. At Goldblatt Systems, we also believe that both health and outcomes must be supported by better data, data that is reinforced with informatics to accelerate its use. We are investing in precision medication solutions because treating patients is not a one-size-fits-all activity. We are presenting on our AI solution, GoLeaf.ai, at this expo because we also believe, like Danny, that vital information is trapped in the observations recorded during a patient encounter. Too often we chase and create data that lacks the semantic transference of informatics. SNOMED has long shared this vision. The COVID pandemic has shown us just how far we have to go. Build, building usable networks of readily available information must focus not simply on data capture, but also its form formulation into useful information that can be used outside of a point in time. Consider polypharmacy challenges. A precision medication solution should provide the informatics and analytics to support medical decisions that are proactive and supported by the holistic review of all factors, including genomics, the recorded signals from all medical encounters, and family and social history data. This information is spotty at best at this point. Part of that challenge is the lack of data, but a bigger challenge can be time itself. Artificial intelligence is just one area where we can combat time. For example, in clinically curating the universe of data surrounding every patient. Building informatics networks that fill the gaps in our understanding require better data models, more effective data acquisition, 
and the immediate interoperability that semantic informatics makes possible. We share this vision with Danny, whose work includes leading pharmaco and device epidemiology research at Newfield Department of Orthopedics and Rheumatology and Muscular Sciences. Danny has impressive experience designing, analyzing, and interpreting electronic medical records from around the world, including the United Kingdom's Clinical Practice Research Data Link and Spain's Syndiap database, Denmark's Danish uh, health registries, as well as organizations in Italy and the Netherlands. Finally, Danny joined the European Health Data and Evidence Network and the Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics groups in an effort to accelerate and improve the quality of real-world evidence internationally. Human beings are complex systems, and data without informatics often falls short. With the emergence of cloud, big data, AI, and other advanced computing capabilities, we still need to do much better to make healthcare more proactive versus reactive, knowledge-driven versus data creation, and provide insights at the point of care. Please listen thoughtfully and consider joining us on this journey. With that said, please welcome our speaker, Dr. Danny Prieto Alhambra. Hello, I'm Danny Prieto Alhambra. I'm a professor of uh, pharmacoepidemiology at the University of Oxford, and I am research coordinator for the Eden Network, which I will be discussing later today. I'm delighted uh, to be the, the James Reed Memorial Lecturer this year. And uh, I still remember when I moved to the UK around 12 years ago, and I was uh, asked um, to produce some read code lists uh, for my research. Uh, I'm very fond of, of those memories. I'm going to be talking today about distributed network analysis to generate reliable real-world evidence in the middle of the pandemic, uh, leveraging the OMOP common data model to unravel COVID-19. These are the five topics I will cover. Uh, I will talk about why open science in distributed networks is important. I will then talk uh, for a bit about Eden and what we're doing in the project. I will then cover the uh, experience that we've had for the last year and a half with Eden and Odyssey doing research on COVID. I will then talk about how we leveraged all our tools and the data to hack COVID-19 and unravel this condition, this new condition. And then finally, I will talk about some work we're doing on vaccines and vaccine safety and utilization. Okay, just to start uh, with why uh, you should be interested in open science in federated networks. Um, I think it's uh, kind of obvious that the last year and a half, um, there has been a lot of work uh, on uh, real world evidence, uh, real world data, and this has become a time to gather uh, all our efforts and all our resources and work together towards a common goal. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, we have also learned some bad things. Uh, we've learned from the Sarge's Fear initiative that uh, this is not only about having access to data, but also about how that data is used, how it's communicated, and how transparent the access to that data is. Um, we all, I think, in this meeting will agree that data saves lives, uh, but we've also learned in the last couple of years that uh, poor practice with data can also produce harm. And in fact, um, there were two papers uh, produced by the Strategy Sphere um, uh, Initiative that ended being retracted despite previous publication in big journals like The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine. And I believe strongly that open science is the way forward uh, in real world evidence in general, but also even more importantly, in federated networks to prevent uh, that from happening again. Uh, so how do we do this uh, in Eden and in Odyssey? We uh, have a, a policy of uh, transparency. That means that we share all our artifacts and documents going from the ETL, the harmonization of data and the documentation of that process, data quality dashboards, we pre-specify and publish or register all our protocols before we do any analysis. We have standardized analytical packages that are reused and are shared and the whole analytical code from curation to dissemination is shared in a public repository. 
we also share all our study diagnostics and we finally report all the re analysis and all the results from our analysis, including sensitivity analysis, secondary analysis, and, and all that um, in a very comprehensive way, typically using uh, interactive web applications. We believe, and I believe myself, that this transparency is key to reproducibility, interpretability, and generating trust um, in, in the field of real-world evidence. Let me now talk related to this about EDEN. EDEN is the European Health Data and Evidence Network. Uh, EDEN is about harmonizing data, creating a network around Europe uh, that can uh, generate research and evidence in the future, or even currently already, creating a community and a self-sustained community of people and researchers and, uh, and the public uh, who produce this uh, evidence and generate knowledge, educating people in the use of these data. And we have created what we call the Eden Academy, which is a fantastic online free resource. And finally, uh, of course, uh, enabling outcomes-driven healthcare at a European level. Eden is an IMI consortium with 22 partners and uh, a substantial budget, uh, and uh, we have uh, been investing in the uh, generation of a network, of a federated data network that looks like this, with different databases of different types around Europe, primary care data, um, hospital records, claims data, um, registry data, all mapped to a common data model, OMOP in this, in this occasion, uh, that's uh, then used to produce um, federated analysis or distributed network analysis, as, as we show here. Uh, we have tools that have been previously generated by Odyssey and that we are improving and reusing. Uh, and we have a community of researchers who run queries in a federated network and basically get results back from the data partners without touching the data directly. This is a very quick picture of the OMOP common data model. I'm not going to extend on this. You are probably all familiar with it. Um, it's a patient-centric, tabular, extendable common data model built and bespoke for analytics and with a relational design. I think that is all you need to know, really. Um, and you will learn more if you're interested by looking at the Eden Academy and related resources. Eden has uh, three pillars. Um, and, uh, and of course, we also have data partners. We have um, published uh, a total of four data partner calls. We give up grants of up to 100,000 euro for people, for colleagues who have access to, uh, to interesting real world data. And we um, have facilitated with that funding the mapping of a total of 98 data sources or data mapped by 1898 partners covering uh, in total more than 400 million patient records around Europe. Then we have these three pillars that you see here, the technical architecture, where we certify IT SMEs to help or to work with data partners for the mapping. We have a data partner catalog. We are producing fair tooling, quality dashboards, security frameworks, and we have an SME directory. Pillar two, um, where uh, I am the research coordinator, is all about generating evidence. We're doing drug utilization studies, drug safety studies, device safety studies, HDA research, and, uh, and also creating disruptive ways of generating evidence in a reliable but rapid way at scale in Europe. We then have pillar three, which is our engagement um, and education, as you can see. Eden is growing. Um, this is the last piece of news after our most recent call. And uh, this is news from uh, last June when we resolved our fourth um, data partner call. And as you can see here, we incorporated um, quite a few new data partners and quite a lot of data. Um, and we are now just about uh, to open our fifth data partner call as I'm recording this. And the data call, data partner call opens on the October 13th and will be open for around a month. Um, we are looking for colleagues from around uh, Europe with access to granular data, long-term follow-up, 
uh, an inpatient data with in this particular occasion uh, interest in countries that have not been represented previously in the network and also looking specifically but not only not exclusively into um, very specific conditions that are sometimes underrepresented uh, in in real world data sets, including rare autoimmune inflammatory disease, cancer, and uh, implantable or medical devices. So I, I want to uh, to encourage you all, if you have access to interesting data, to look into this call when it's published and to see if you're eligible for one of these grants. It would be wonderful to have you joining the Eden family. Let me now tell you a little bit about the um, exciting bit of the work. The the the, the Generate the generation of evidence in, in the Eden and Odyssey communities during COVID. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to be the organizer um, of an Odyssey Eden meeting um, in Oxford in March 2020, which unfortunately had to be cancelled due to the uh, arrival of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. We then used that as an opportunity and transformed that face-to-face -face meeting into a virtual study a four-day activity where we met more than 350 colleagues from 30 countries. We wrote many protocols, we wrote many phenotypes and cohorts and definitions, we programmed a lot of analysis, we reviewed a lot of literature, and we finally produced four um, bits of uh, information and, uh, and four final products um, that were uh, and, and still are very important. We produced the first large-scale international phenotyping of COVID. I'm talking about March 2020, when some were still saying COVID was basically like a flu. Secondly, we produced the first internationally validated prediction model to tease out who was at very high risk of having severe uh, forms of the disease. We conducted what still remains as the largest uh, study ever done on the safety of hydroxychloroquine, which at that time was being heavily used for the treatment of COVID. And we also produced a massive network for research. That network has continued to grow. This is from around uh, five, six months ago. And at that time, we had access uh, in this federated fashion to data from more than 4.5 million people infected with SARS-CoV-2, more than 1.2 million people hospitalized with COVID-19, data from America, from Asia, and from Europe, as you can see in this map. And this is just a teaser on, on what the uh, data looks like with uh, different databases providing different types of data. For instance, this database here is uh, containing at that time around 10,000 people diagnosed and about 3,000 3, or uh, 3,400 people hospitalized with COVID-19. In red, you see the people diagnosed with the disease. In blue, the people hospitalized. And you can quickly realize how there is an imbalance in the age profiles with most people diagnosed with the disease being in the 20s, 30s, 40s, but uh, an overrepresentation of people in their 60s and 70s amongst those hospitalized. If you then look at, for instance, this database where you also have information in green now for the people admitted to ICU, you can clearly see how most of the people uh, who ended up in ICU uh, with COVID were in ages between 40 and 70, 75 years old. Okay, I will now describe how we worked uh, out a way to phenotype and to hack COVID-19. Um, with real-world data, uh, we believe we can do three things, three main uh, types of studies. First one would be clinical characterization, which is basically describing what happens to a cohort of people. Second thing is prediction, where we try to infer who, at a personal level, who is at risk uh, of having an outcome. And finally, a population level effect estimation would be looking at the causal effect of an intervention or an exposure. For this uh, first bit of my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, clinical characterization studies. Um, and I'm going to start by telling you the story of how we came up with a definition for COVID-19 back in March 2020. At that time, this was a new disease. We didn't know much about it. And we had to come up with an ideal definition that would be clinically relevant based on the information we, we had at hand. It had to be actionable and interoperable for different types of data and different healthcare systems around the world. 
We wanted it to be transportable across the network of international databases that we were collaborating with. We wanted the definition and the phenotype to be sensitive and specific for the identification of this disease. And of course, we wanted it to be feasible to be possible. And if that was all achievable, we would have been delighted. What um, we ended up doing was creating a number of possible phenotypes, one based on tests. So we wanted a cohort of people tested positive in a real-time PCR for the virus that causes COVID-19. At that time, in the first um, half of 2020, there was insufficient testing, and therefore we also had to rely on clinical diagnosis, and people with a clinical diagnosis of COVID-19 were uh, our second cohort that we were interested in. Third cohort were people hospitalized with a diagnosis of COVID-19 or a real-time PCR test. Then we had a cohort of people admitted in ICU, and of course, mortality with COVID-19. You could come up potentially with different flavors of combinations of the above. And this is what this, uh, theoretically at least, could look like. Uh, we would have people tested positive, we would have people, sorry, people tested for SARS-CoV-2, people, a subset of those testing positive. We then had a number of people who had a COVID diagnosis or a positive test. As I said, at that time, there were many people who had a diagnosis without a test. Uh, we then had people hospitalized with a positive test. Most of the people hospitalized with COVID-19 had a test. Um, however, there were still some data sources that didn't have access to PCR tests, and therefore there we had to rely on diagnosis or test. And then the same would be true for people uh, admitted in ICU or, or requiring intensive services. So a number of different definitions. And then on top of that, we were also interested in very specific subpopulations like children and adolescents, elderly people, um, different races and ethnicities, different index months to see how things changed over time. People with hypertension, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, obesity, asthma, COPD, you name it. A number of, uh, of um, conditions that were of importance and that we considered as subgroups uh, for all our analysis. This has resulted in numerous publications. Uh, we have a paper focusing on children and adolescents. We have a paper looking at obese patients. We had a paper looking at people with autoimmune disease. We have a paper looking at people with cancer and so on and so forth. We were interested to learn on how uh, or what people looked like at the time of diagnosis. Uh, what were they like before they were diagnosed with COVID-19 in terms of demographics, um, conditions, comorbidities, drug use, and so on. And also we were interested to know how they were managed, what treatments they were um, given. Uh, we were interested to know what symptoms they presented with. We wanted to know also what their outcomes were and what um, healthcare resource uh, was needed to treat them. These are the two first papers, or maybe two of the key papers uh, that we published from this exercise trying to hack COVID-19. The first one published uh, in April 2020 in Nature Communications was the deep phenotyping of over 34,000 patients with hospitalized with COVID-19. And the second one is a BMJ paper uh, looking at the use of medicines uh, for patients admitted to hospital with COVID-19. As I said earlier, we followed um, best practices in the open science collaboration that we had set up by pre-specifying a study protocol and sharing all our analytical source code. And this is all accessible in this GitHub repository here. We shared all our uh, phenotype definitions, the codes that were used uh, to create these cohorts. Uh, we then posted our results in MedArchive and in other uh, preprint service as early as possible. And finally, we shared all our results in this, uh, in this shiny application uh, for full reporting. As you can see, we included more than 34,000 patients from three continents, almost 82,000 patients with influenza in the previous session, seasons as a benchmark. And then we extracted all the information from those people's uh, medical history or, or or records um, going from almost 5,000 to almost 12,000 features, depending on the database, to then phenotype these patients accordingly. This picture, I think, shows uh, the main bulk of results. What you see here is a plot where you have the standardized mean difference in comorbidities 
and medicines amongst patients diagnosed, comparing patients diagnosed with flu in previous seasons to patients diagnosed with COVID. And everything that's below this vertical line with a zero would be more common in the flu patients than in the COVID patients. And anything above would be things that are or conditions or, or drugs that are more common in people admitted with COVID-19. Very quickly and very early on, you can see that COVID is not like the flu. People admitted with COVID tend to be healthier. They have most of the conditions are more common in the uh, flu patients. They have related to that probably less uh, medicines used. And there were a few exclusions, a few exceptions, sorry, that were common in, in most databases like obesity or diabetes that seemed to be more uh, common amongst the uh, COVID patients than the flu patients. That still remains interesting and, and of course uh, an area for research. This is now uh, one of the main pictures of our bracketization study where you can see the use of different uh, report post uh, medicines for the treatment of COVID-19 amongst hospitalized patients in a number of uh, databases, data sources around the world. And as you can see hydroxychloroquine was very variably used in different places. Like there was a private uh, hospitals chain in Spain where 85% of the people admitted were getting hydroxychloroquine compared to a large uh, academic hospital in Barcelona where only 40% of people were given the treatment. In the US there was also a lot of variability and in Asia, uh, for instance in China, most patients, almost no patient received hydroxychloroquine while in South Korea about a quarter were on this treatment. This is even more so for other medicines like dexamethasone or azithromycin, as you can see in this plot. Interestingly, if one then looks at this over time, you can see how um, there was a very quick uptake in the use of hydroxychloroquine and something between 30-40% and more than 80% of the patients admitted with COVID-19 received this treatment in March and April. At the end of April, we and other colleagues uh, published some um, concerns about the safety of hydroxychloroquine and uh, some regulators, including the FDA and the European Medicines Agency, um, published uh, uh, warnings about the cardiovascular safety of this medicine. And of course, the um, recovery trial came out uh, with some results suggesting that the treatment with hydroxychloroquine didn't have any benefit. So that combination of no benefit with some risk resulted in what you see here, which is a um, decline in the use of hydroxychloroquine, which has uh, remained there for the rest of the year 2020. And the opposite happened with hexamethasone, a medicine, a corticosteroid that wasn't being used very much uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but then in June, mid-June, the recovery trial found that this medicine could uh, uh, reduce mortality in patients uh, hospitalized with COVID-19. And as you can see, treatment then became more popular and has become one of the mainstream therapies uh, for people with COVID-19 and respiratory problems. Okay, incredibly enough, um, only one year after, after we were doing this research, we were already doing research to look at um, COVID vaccines in preparation and before the vaccines were approved, we did this work to look at the characterization of the epidemiology of the pre-specified adverse events of special interest that had been shortlisted by international regulators to monitor the safety of COVID vaccines. Um, this is just a, a key picture of results. As you can see, we had access to loads of data from Australia, France, Germany, Japan, the US, the UK, Spain, and the Netherlands. And we basically produced age and gender specific incidence rates for all these um, a total of 15 adverse events of special interest uh, in all those countries. Um, and you can see that depicted in this, in this beautiful plot. Um, some key findings include um, the variation uh, in age and, uh, and, and related to age and sex. For instance, you can see how acute myocardial infarction, of course, is more common in more elderly people and more common typically in men than women. Appendicitis follows this kind of um, peak around uh, around the teenagehood and then a decline, so it becomes less common with, with older age. 
And anaphylaxis, for instance, is an example of a condition that's more common in children and younger people than in the elderly. So this is very important uh, when estimating whether what happens after a vaccine is surprising or not. Regulators will typically, at the beginning um, of a new product um, approval, rely on spontaneous reports and then compare the number of spontaneous reports observed to the expected number based on these uh, background rates. Um, and this is a paper that has been heavily cited and used by many regulators, including the European Medicines Agency. Another key finding was that there are some conditions that have very variable coding, like narcolepsy, for instance, where you have a 100-fold difference between some databases, even in the same age and sex range, and others that are much more um, homogeneously recorded, like Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is, again, something <clears throat> that's very important. This variation across databases has to be uh, borne in mind when one is comparing post-vaccine to background rates uh, for regulatory purposes. And this is a key table uh, providing the, the meta-analytic estimates of incidence rates by age and sex for all 15 adverse special, adverse events of special interest, which is again very useful, I hope, uh, for regulators and, and stakeholders. So our conclusions uh, from this work, um, sorry, we cannot be sorry, but it's impossible to say how many uh, of one given event one can expect if you don't tell us the, the age and sex distribution of the population that has been vaccinated. If one, if one is asked to produce only one figure for comparisons, then that needs to be adjusted or standardized by age and sex and compared to the, uh, and the same should be done for the post-vaccine data. And then finally, where possible, one should use the same data source for the observed, so that would be the post-vaccine and the expected pre-vaccine rates. And this is exactly uh, what I'm going to be presenting next. Uh, some preliminary work we have been doing, looking at the observed versus expected rates of thrombosis uh, and thrombocytopenia following vaccination and infection with SARS-CoV-2 in data from Spain and the UK, again, uh, in, uh, in the OMOC CDM. This is a study that was funded by the European Medicines Agency and the analysis were all run independently by us at Oxford and colleagues in Erasmus Medical Center, Rotterdam. This presentation has not been reviewed or endorsed in any way by the agency, by the European Medicines Agency. So we know that uh, from as early as April, March, April this year, um, there were some spontaneous reports of venous and arterial thromboembolisms following some COVID vaccines. Uh, we also know that there's some data suggesting that COVID itself can cause uh, or lead to an increased uh, risk of thromboembolism. And there is, of course, also acknowledged uh, kind of signals, uh, safety signals with the AstraZeneca and Janssen COVID vaccines, potentially inducing thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndromes. There have been a number of studies uh, in total, as far as I know, there are three studies out there now looking at this in real world data. Uh, one study from Denmark and Norway, relatively small with 250,000, uh, 50,000 people vaccinated, uh, showing a double risk of VTE in the vaccinees compared to the expected rates uh, and an 80% excess risk of uh, pulmonary embolism. There's a larger study, about 10 times larger, from Scotland, which doesn't replicate those findings and actually it suggests there might be an increased risk of AT thrombocytopenia and ITP with the AstraZeneca vaccine that, however, was not replicated in a more robust um, analysis called the self-controlled case series. And uh, these were our methods. We uh, used data from Spain, a database called CDAP that had been uh, mapped to the OMOP CBM as part of an Eden uh, grant uh, data until the end of May 2021. And then from the UK, we used data from CPID Gold and Orum. This is primary care records covering, I guess, around 15 to 20% of the UK population. And again, mapped to the OMOP common data model as part of an Eden grant. We looked at uh, participants uh, with at least one year of follow-up to make sure that we could um, ensure a, a wash-up uh, or a look-back before uh, identifying outcomes and with a number of sensitivity analyses.
we had four cohorts of interest, people vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine, people vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine, people diagnosed or testing positive uh, for COVID-19, and then a background population of people registered in the databases for whom we analyzed their rates of uh, venous thromboembolism, arterial thromboembolism, and TTS in the years 2017 to 2019. Follow-up went from vaccine to up to 28 days post each dose, and then for the COVID-19 cohorts, up to 90 days post-diagnosis. And as I said, for the background rates, we used the entire population and looked at the period that goes from 2017 to 2019. <clears throat> Study outcomes I've already covered, venous thromboembolism, arterial thromboembolism, uh, thrombocytopenia, and the combination of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. We calculated the incidence rates post-vaccine and post-COVID in those uh, three cohorts and then compared them to the background population, stratified by age and sex, and then produced uh, by indirect standardization, a standardized incidence ratio, which is a measure of how much more or less than expected um, you are seeing post-vaccination compared to background population after taking into account age and sex differences. The results of this uh, analysis, we had more than 4.5 million people in the general population cohort from Catalonia, Spain, and 2.3 million from the UK. We had uh, almost a million people with one dose of uh, the Pfizer vaccine, almost 800,000 with a second dose, and uh, more than 400,000 people vaccinated with AZ, and more than 200,000 with COVID. And in the UK, <coughs> we had almost 1.7 million vaccinated with Pfizer one dose, almost 1.9 million with Chadox and almost 300,000 COVID patients. As you can see here very quickly, the uptake of the vaccine was very different in both countries. In Spain, most people got the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine was uh, preferred or prioritized only for very specific subgroups. You can see if you look at the age distribution and the dates. And in the UK, it was only Pfizer until the AZ vaccine was approved, and then it was pretty much 50-50 for, um, for both vaccines. When we then look at the uh, expected uh, and observed numbers, you can see here in this half part of the plot, uh, middle part of the plot, the uh, number, the absolute number of events expected in square compared to observed post-vaccine in circle. Of course, any departure, any difference between both is an increased risk potentially. And you have in blue the first and second dose of Pfizer and in red the AstraZeneca and in orange the COVID patients. You can see at first sight there is much more of an increased risk of vein thrombosis and even more so pulmonary embolism after COVID. And if you look at the right-hand side of the plot, you here have the standardized incidence ratio and 95% confidence intervals. Uh, and as you can see, there is a little bit, I think the standardized incidence ratio is about 1.15, 1.20, a, a slight increase in risk of DVT, some blood clots uh, with the Pfizer vaccine in this analysis and not with the Chadox vaccine, interestingly, but a very striking increase in risk after COVID, as you can see, with up to 800% increases in venous thromboembolism overall and up to 1,500% uh, increases in uh, pulmonary embolism in particular. Same analysis repeated exactly the same with the same code running now in the city of Spanish OMOP data, and that is the beauty of having the data previously mapped to OMOP, uh, and very similar findings. So you can see here, uh, Sorry, this is now UK data and the previous one was the Spanish data. You can see how there was a potential signal for uh, cerebral thrombosis, which is the signal that has been recognized uh, with AZ vaccine in red, um, and then a striking signal and increased risk uh, with deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism with COVID, and a slight increase of pulmonary embolisms with both vaccines of 1.10, 1.20 with no other um, signals making it to significance. There is a signal potentially for a stroke with thrombocytopenia with the AZ vaccine that again would be very likely related to this signal up there. So in summary, um, we found uh, striking differences between the people vaccinated and the, uh, and the overall population with 
vaccinated cohorts, at least in that first half of the year, being older and less healthy than the general population. These calls for caution when interpreting this data, because we are not adjusting for comorbidities and, uh, and other potential confounders. Um, we had very different uptake and very different use of both vaccines in Spain and the UK, as you saw in the previous plots. And in terms of the signals, we found a 10 to 20% increased risk of venous thromboembolism um, following the Pfizer vaccine in both countries uh, and following the, the AZ vaccine uh, in Spain, which didn't quite make it to significance in the UK, uh, apparently driven by an increase in pulmonary embolism, but a much higher increase. Uh, instead of a 10 to 20%, we're talking now about an 800% and up to a 1.5,000% increased risk uh, following COVID-19. Um, there's also an increased risk of thrombocytopenia following uh, uh, Pfizer in one of the databases and Chadox in the other one, and an increased risk of immune thrombocytopenia with both vaccines in the UK data. Of course, this is uh, observational data with many limitations. I would just like to say that the most uh, important limitation is the lack of adjustment for comorbidities or drug use. Uh, and the complexity of the patients, which is uh, ongoing work uh, that hopefully will will show that these uh, safety signals are even less important than what we are observing in this primary analysis. However, the strengths include uh, the first multinational study to date, most representative including North and South European data, and uh, the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, this is all run on a CDM on OMOPT data and all the analytical code is shared here for anyone to replicate our analysis. With that, I would like to finish and I leave you there my email if you want to get in touch or ask any questions. Thank you so much and I'll be delighted uh, to join you for the discussion. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much indeed for that, Danny, and a, a welcome to this group. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you, and uh, thank you so much for uh, your presentation. Uh, before before uh, we get into the questions and, and your answers, um, I'd like to say a couple of things. First, if you do have questions, do please put them uh, uh, into the uh, question box on your uh, on-air tool. Um, I hope you've all discovered now where to, where to find that. Um, uh, my second point is really one around just reminding everyone that this is the James Reed Memorial Lecture. And I think this is either the 10th or 11th in a sequence uh, over, uh, over the last decade. Um, James Reed, for those of you who don't uh, remember or come from elsewhere, was a general practitioner in the UK and invented the Reed code si system, which was used uh, uh, universally by general practitioners in the UK for many years. And only a couple of years ago has been replaced by SNOMED CT. But I think if we think about James Reed now, he would be absolutely astounded uh, to hear Danny's presentation uh, using data not only from one country, but many countries, um, and using the, uh, a common data source. So I'd like to start the ball rolling uh, with Danny by just asking a very open question about what he thinks the advantages and disadvantages of a common data model, such as the one in Odyssey is, uh, to get universal benefit of data for humankind. Thank you, Charles. Uh, let me just say that I'm uh, honored to, to be the James Reed lecturer this year. As I, as I mentioned, um, my first task when I came to the UK was actually to create um, lists of read codes to create some clinical phenotypes and some work we were doing with primary care um, electronic medical records. Um, um, so it's, it's uh, great uh, to, to contribute to this today. Um, the, the main advantage of the use of a common data model, as I hope kind of transpired from my presentation, is this ability to break international barriers and do work together with colleagues from all over the globe uh, who have invested and, 
and uh, and basically agreed to collaborate um, this increasing um, governance barriers and many others uh, that, that make it difficult to collaborate and to produce uh, evidence in a rapid and reliable manner. The use of a CDM basically allows you to generate um, analytical packages and, and code that can run in a federated or distributed fashion across the globe um, and as we showed during the pandemic in a very rapid and, and reliable way. I think it was um, quite astonishing um, to see how people basically rallied together in March 2020 and produced so much data so quickly from you know three four continents of the world and how we still continue to collaborate that would basically be not possible uh, without the use of a CDM. I guess the main disadvantage of the use of a CDM is the investment that one needs to put into mapping to a common data model into a common language, and that is something that. Um, you know, relies on 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 some efforts that the data partners have to invest, and and that's why um, Eden is um, creating this uh, data partner calls, uh, so that colleagues from, in this case, Europe can contribute uh, to these efforts. Um, yeah, thanks so much for that. Uh, interestingly, actually, Jay Kohler's just put a question up, uh, asking. Uh, what the, well first of all commenting of the um, amazing success and amazing uh, work that uh, you and the Eden team have done but then asking the question could you perhaps go faster should we have another pandemic um, I, I, I'm not sure that <laughs> well I'd be interested to hear your answer about whether it's possible to go faster and indeed whether it's necessary to go faster <laughs> Um, I mean, it's always necessary to go faster. We, we in the 21st century, you know, uh, we we didn't realize we had the pandemic here until we were basically closing schools and uh, workplaces all over Europe. So we were clearly very late uh, to this. Um, I guess there is, uh, if you imagine a kind of scatter plot of reliability and speed, there is some sort of threshold there. And I think we've kind of got close to that. Um, we do uh, a lot of work on phenotyping, a lot of work on validating phenotypes and so on. And I believe that um, that is necessary because, of course, the last thing you want to do is generate unreliable data. Um, and I think the Sergi Sphere scandal kind of demonstrates how speed sometimes, um, you know, has its limitations as well. I think, you know, the fact that uh, by late March we were already producing the first papers on COVID-19 when we were still saying, in many countries this was basically like the flu and we didn't have to do anything about it is quite remarkable um and and the speed at which colleagues from initially south korea started mapping their COVID data uh it, it's an example of how international collaboration should work and, and it's you know something that made me proud as a scientist at the time um yes that, that thank you very much for that um I think one of the things that um, everyone will be thinking a bit about is, uh, I suppose, it, it's worth um, just exploring your experience of using CPRD and whether the fact that much of what is now going into CRPD must be um, SNOMED encoded do you think that's going to make a difference in the longer term to one using the terminology but adding to the richness of the interpretation of the data? Yeah, so I guess um, it's worth mentioning that of course CPID now has two different um, data sources. One is CPID Gold um, and the other one is CPID Orum coming from two different electronic medical record systems. And um, as you probably know, CPID Gold used read codes um, and uh, while Orum is mostly fed with uh, SNOMED codes. So I think the use of a CDM basically makes, and this is the reason why my team started investing in, in mapping this data, it makes it so much easier for us um, to basically run analysis in both data sets separately, but using exactly the same code and replicating as such the whole analytical pipeline in both databases without additional effort. Basically, the idea is that we can create a prediction algorithm or run an analysis in gold, for instance, in the OMOPT instance of gold, and then rerun the same analytical code in Orum 
without changing a comma in the in the whole analytical code and that is a massive advantage i believe um of of mapping both databases to a mob uh, of course the effort required to do that mapping uh, is in some way different because mapping read to uh, snowmet um is of course more work than not mapping snowmet to snowmet right um but but the use of a cdm basically enables this kind of replication exercise which i believe is at the core of science in the 21st century when you know with all the kind of reproducibility crisis that we've had in the past yeah thanks there's a more detailed question uh, which wants that asking you to explore whether the source of the of, of of the clinical data in other words if it's a specialist or perhaps a generalist or indeed a general practitioner um uh, and uh perhaps using the expressivity of snowmed um at a um, point of care compared to say icd-10 coding from coders uh, or some other coding ap approach uh, might cause or might uh, result in a different interpretation uh, and he, he, the questioner is particularly interested in the question of narcolepsy uh, which uh, I guess the source of data around that narcolepsy in relation to vaccination for example uh, might be really important and I, I wonder if you have any comments on that no, that's an excellent question. I don't think I have a solid answer, to be honest. Um, I can just tell you that um, in that bit of work that I showed on narcolepsy and all the other adverse events of special interest, we had to do a lot of work on what we call cohort diagnostics, which is basically what follows a clinical phenotype generation. So we basically create an algorithm to identify a condition or a phenotype and then run it in all the um, contributing data sources uh, to basically look at the characteristics of uh, of the people who are uh, diagnosed with that, looking at the features of those people, looking at their exposures before and after. Um, and that is something that we do across all the network uh, to make sure that we're looking at similar things. Some conditions are relatively straightforward, some are harder, like, um, for instance, the combination of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia, which I mentioned uh, in the last bit of my presentation, is one that's been really, really difficult because some uh, data sources don't have laboratory data, for instance. Uh, others have only primary care lab data, others have hospital lab data, and then that results in a very different proportion of people with thrombosis having a kind of additional measurement of, of uh, platelet counts. Um, so yeah, I guess it's a long answer to say that I don't know the answer to <laughs> your question, but that we uh, basically have to do this on a not only a study per study basis, but on an outcome per outcome basis, because indeed that can cause very different um, answers in different data sources. Yes, I wonder if we could drill a bit more into that actually, um, Danny. I've been doing a study with one of our, the data scientists at Bart's Health, uh, mm -hmm. supported by HDI UK, where we're trying to find very, very early signals of, uh, of um, um, uh, of vaccine-induced uh, thrombocytopenic, uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic uh, purpura, which is, as you know, one of the more dangerous complications of vaccine. And, and what we've been doing there is to uh, uh, use a joint platform where we find the vaccine data for patient for for the citizens from primary care and matching that to uh, people who've attended our emergency department and then tracking their process through hosp the hospital using the emergency care data set and the SNOMED uh, terms associated with that. And then any problem listing that happens in our record as patients progress uh, and linking that to the laboratory data. Uh, and we have an algorithm that uh, uh, finds patients with appropriate uh, um, ECL constrained codes for thrombosis and linking that to the presence of thrombocytopenia, uh, FDP uh, raised and the presence of platelet four anti uh, factor four antibodies. And what we've found, of course, is that the algorithm works perfectly if all of those things are present in the record. But where they're not, you end up with literally uh, thousands, if, in fact, uh, yeah, thousands of patients uh, with possible complications of vaccine. So uh, there's a real 
I think, anxiety about scaring the population because uh, your, your data appears to show very high rates or, or possible high rates of complication when that, of course, is absolutely not the case. And I wonder um, what you, your experience of linking the lab data to SNOMED encoded information or indeed other codes. Um, is there something that we should be doing as a community to try and improve that? So, in the work that I've been doing, I've only been working on data that has been previously mapped um, to, to a common data model, and that made our life so much easier. I think I probably spoke a lot about um, the use of um, the CDM to enable collaboration across the network and international collaboration. I didn't speak too much about the um, the value of of the CDM to uh, analyze data that comes from different sources. Um, we have done a lot of work on this, as I mentioned, for the European Medicines Agency, and we've continued our effort to try and phenotype TTS and VITT uh, using data from all over Europe. And I can tell you that um, the places where they do have very good lab data linked uh, to clinical records are the ones that uh, more reliably can identify this phenomenon, this clinical problem, right? Uh, so we have some colleagues from Scotland, uh, from Fife, who have um, been doing some work on this, colleagues from Serbia who also have access to uh, EMR data linked to uh, lab uh, records, um, and the ability to have everything, all that data mapped previously to OMO basically facilitates the effort dramatically. Yeah, great answer. Thank you very much. Um, in the last few minutes, uh, Danny, can I just again ask you a very general question? So uh, the Eden network is expanding and, uh, and uh, you know, new hospitals and new healthcare systems are uh, joining Eden and uh, using the resources to map their data and so on. And I wondered if you could give a sort of overview of where you think the future plans of uh, using the data network will get to uh, and uh, you know if for let's say in five years time we were to invite you again to give a plenary to the snowmed community where do you think things would be uh, in the european uh, network for healthcare data yes so so i think you didn't even still only halfway through we still have more than two years to go but I hope and I think the leadership of the overall project would agree with me that the next half of the project should all be about using, um, generating evidence basically. So collaborating with the people who have been mapping their data uh, to generate as much evidence as possible to inform uh, clinical practice and, and to, to make healthcare safer and better. Um, that is what I would hope I will come back to explain in five years' time uh, to this NOMAD community. I hope that we will come back with a lot of um, reliable, reproducible and trusted information that we have generated from the EDEN network. We are collaborating with um, regulators, as I mentioned, other stakeholders, academia. We are, we've recently got a couple uh, European IMI grants to leverage um, the use of this network. So, so I think the future is basically now working together with all the colleagues um, in the Eden community and, and all the data partners and other people who have joined us to generate more and more evidence and to continue collaboration with um, international colleagues uh, from Odyssey and, and similar platforms. Fantastic. And just one last question. What should the SNOMED community do for you, Danny? I would say keep working as hard as you are to to keep the <laughs> snowy vocabularies up to speed. And I think it's been quite amazing, actually, in the last year, there's been so much work into, you know, the incorporation of, of new codes and uh, and um, yeah, and unreliable ways of coding uh, COVID and, and its complications that, of course, is a condition that we never had um, before. So we had to kind of come up with um, in the last year and a half. So it's, it's been quite amazing seeing that happen. Thank you so much. Um, and so uh, to round off, Danny, thank you for a very clear exposition of some fantastic work, which is, uh, you know, uh, of it really international importance in understanding 
uh, the nature of the pandemic, ways of protecting ourselves from the infection, uh, and the, the enormous contribution that you've personally made and that the Eden Network and the data collectors all around the world have made uh, to that effort. So I would like to uh, thank you once again for a fantastic session and look forward to closer working with you in the future. So thanks thank you again. So much. Thank you so much. I'm obviously the lucky person representing a huge community behind me. So um, thanks, thanks for, for the invitation again.